Church here, and welcome to the Game Grinder. Today we'll be reviewing Hyperlight Drifter. Hyperlight Drifter was developed by fledgling studio Heart Machine, and initially began its life as a crowdfunded game via Kickstarter, with an initial goal of $27,000. Within a day of the campaign being posted, backers nearly had given quadruple that goal, and by the end of the campaign the game had raised around $600,000. The game was initially slated for a release in 2014, but with the massive interest and addition of many stretch goals and extra content, on top of the game creator's own heart disease issues, the game was delayed until 2016. As of this review, Hyperlight Drifter has been released on the PC, OS X, and is currently expecting releases on the PS4 and Xbox One in the middle of 2016. I like to use this label quite a bit, but it is what it is, and Hyperlight Drifter is a 2D isometric action-adventure Metroidvania game done in a style that's an obvious throwback to the retro 8-bit and 16-bit era. Now unlike my other reviews, I'd like to share and narrate the introduction to this game, as it really sets the tone and gives us enough information for us to begin making our assumptions in regards to the story. The story of Hyperlight Drifter in many ways is abstract and up to interpretation, so these are my thoughts on it. I'll give a spoiler warning before moving on to that section of the review later. The game opens up within a vision. A technologically advanced region has harnessed the hidden powers of the pink energy we see throughout the game. From this they had created the Wellspring, and in their vanity perhaps tried to become gods. Upon activation of the Immortal Cell, its power is unleashed and a massive explosion decimates the land, and gigantic titans are set upon the people of each region. We are then introduced to the Drifter, who seems to have some affliction as he or she coughs blood, which will then follow them throughout the remainder of the quest. Behind the scenes of this chaos is an evil force which plots to stop the Drifters and spread its corruption throughout the world. In the Drifter's flight, we learn the Titans have since been destroyed. We'll then meet what I assume to be the Good Force, an omnipotent jackal, who seems to give these visions to the Drifters in hopes of guiding them to destroying the Immortal Cell. But this will be no simple task, as the evil force will not remain idle and allow these Drifters to end its corruption. We then awake upon a shore, under an ancient statue of what resembles a dog-like figure. Upon heading south, the drifter once again begins to cough up blood, and this will be a continual issue as we progress through this journey. Perhaps bringing an end to this evil force may relieve this affliction, but we have no true indication this is the case. Only time and success will tell. As we continue upon our path, some sort of hallucination begins, and before collapsing, the corrupted figure appears and approaches the drifter before passing out. It seems another drifter, the pink drifter, had saved us, and brought us back to good health. This drifter also leaves an indication of our quest goal regarding what we need to seek out in the surrounding regions. We'll find ourselves in a centralized hub town, the remnants of the surviving friendly factions, and this location serves as our base if you will, where we can eventually purchase upgrades with gear bits we find in the wilds, or returning to a home we can change up our cape, sword, and robot buddy. Here we may also get small glimpses into the events that have happened through dialogue with the locals. From here it's up to us to discover the answer to the visions of the Drifter, and possibly cure the apparent affliction the Drifter suffers from. How we choose this is up to us. Within the center of the town is a panel that when triangled nodes are found will light up, eventually releasing locks, and eventually leads us to the answers we seek. From the hub town we have four directions to choose, and four very different regions to explore and discover its triangle nodes. To the east we'll find a water-based temple area of the now hostile frog-like creatures and the few surviving mouse-like humanoids. To the north is the great mountain temple of the bird-like people, now seemingly corrupted by a fanatical-like cult. To the west are the raccoon race and the remnants of an ancient war left the region enveloped in crystals. The south is a desolate region that is accessible once the other region locks are disengaged and underground we find what appears to be some sort of facility harboring hostile mechanical and lizard-like creatures. As I've already said, a lot of story specifics are really up to interpretation, and these clues can be pieced together by events and evidence we'll find through each region. For an in-depth analysis, I'm going to include a link in the description to a fascinating Reddit thread that reinforces some of my thoughts regarding this. At the beginning of our journey, we'll start out with the most basic of actions. We're equipped with an energy sword, a pistol, and a dash maneuver that by the end of the journey we'll have to master to survive. During our exploration of the regions, we'll be able to find a variety of items and locations to further help answer questions, or allow us to further enhance our skills. Hidden throughout we'll find gear bits, and as more are accumulated, we may turn in to use to purchase additional abilities and upgrades. These range from enhanced dash techniques, useful sword skills, enhanced capabilities for our firearms and health kits, and purchase a helpful small explosive device to aid us in combat. 
There are also strange monoliths hidden in each region, and as they are discovered and activated, will reflect within a library of sorts in the northern region. This text has since been decrypted by determined players to figure out what these messages may mean, and I'll include a link to the Reddit thread about it in the description of this review. Also, we may find the remains of what are assumed to be fallen drifters, who may have keys that can be used on hidden doors, or they may also give us alternate gear, other capes, swords, and robots, which will give minor bonuses to abilities to further aid in our survival. Lastly, of course, is our main goal, discovering the Triangle Nodes. Like everything else, these are hidden within each region, and not only unlock the pillars in the central hub, but there are usually special doors that can be accessed depending on how many of these nodes are discovered in each region. There are 8 total in each area, and once these are found, as well as the door requiring all 8, we'll gain access to what I'd call challenge rooms. These areas will push our skills to the limit, and usually provide handy rewards like additional firearms or gear. This isn't as necessarily easy as it may sound though. This world is full of mysteries and secrets, and many of these are easy to miss. Sometimes there may be hidden passages through a wall, or perhaps a small gap to squeeze through. Also along many ledges, our robot helper may detect hidden energy platforms that will allow us to reach normally unreachable ledges or paths. I often found myself running against every wall there was, and walking along every ledge to find all these nooks and crannies. Fortunately, these never felt like a chore, and really gives a great sense of discovery and achievement when they're found. The different regions are host to a variety of hostile forces, and will require various strategies to survive. There's a really nice assortment of enemies in each area, and they're all unique to the regions. Fortunately, we'll gain access to many tools to further aid in our journey. Some areas may need to be revisited once we've discovered certain firearms, keys, or gained abilities to access all the hidden secrets within. Each region also has a few reoccurring events that will help us piece together the story of the world and help us locate the main bosses, respectively. Usually not too far into the region, we'll find a local who will tell us of an event that shifted the power of the region, usually the main boss on how they've taken control. We'll also have reoccurring encounters with the Pink Drifter, who will show us where the boss of the regions are. Bosses can be quite challenging, but the typical enemies are no joke either. Hyperlight Drifter is a considerably challenging game, and handles death very well. After death, we'll restart the last section we entered quickly, and there's little interruption in between. Besides the fast respawn, the music doesn't break, which helps to keep us in the moment, and in many ways reminds me of how Hotline Miami handled death. It is no thing to get our asses handed to us, but it's relatively forgiving. Just learn from our mistakes and push through. The autosaves happen frequently enough too, especially in the underground areas, so little time is lost between deaths. There's a couple bonus-like things we can do once we unlock certain pillars. We can access a soccer field of sorts to play a game against some annoying little bastard, or after acquiring enough keys, may access a few additional challenge rooms in what I assume to be a special room with credits to some of the Kickstarter backers. Of course, Hyperlight Drifter includes some achievements that can be earned, though I only managed to get a few during my playthrough, and the ones I didn't get had obscure descriptions. The internet has yet to compile an effective list or guide to help with these when I wrote this review. There's also a New Game Plus mode, which will keep the skill upgrades, but only get 2 points of health versus the usual 5. I played it a little, and I gotta say it was pretty brutal. Before moving on, I will be talking about the ending spoilers, so if you'd like to skip ahead, go to the time listed on the screen, or click the annotation. Let's move on then. Throughout our journey, besides encountering the Jackal at certain times, the Drifter will have visions of the Corrupted Bean, who then appears to kill the Drifter, but once blacking out, the Drifter will awake and push on. Besides the story of the regions and the people we're able to interpret during our playthrough, we'll learn that the Pink Drifter spent most of his time protecting the locals. After unlocking the pillars from the west, north, and east, we'll once again meet the Pink Drifter, and he then tells us his family had also died of the same sickness that we share, and once he had left, he began to have the same visions as us. I believe in his journey and helping the locals, he lost his way and had passed along this quest to us. He then dies, and we continue on to the final pieces of this task. Once unlocking the final pillar, we'll return to town and descend into the ruins of the immortal cell. Deep below the surface, we'll make our way into the inner sanctum, passing along statues that may signify the existing races, or perhaps the two godlike beings that seem to be at play. The corrupted being spastically appears as we continue through, and the drifter's affliction seems to be at its peak, as the coffin and blood seems to be getting worse. Entering the final chamber of the immortal cell, we'll face off with the evil being, and in its defeat, the drifter impales the immortal cell, destroying it, and releasing the land of its corruption. The drifter staggers out, while leaving a trail of blood in his wake, following the jackal through the chaos. Upon exiting to a small camp near one of the ominous statues, the drifter collapses against it. 
With that, the Jackal returns to one of the pillars from our vision, and its seals crack and die out. With the wellspring disappearing, the evil over the land appears to fade away. The drifter stands within a blue sea, and from the abdomen we'll see blood begin to seep through, and in a final wince of pain, it all goes black. Once loading into the save select screen, next to our completed game will be a new selection, and once chosen, will be shown a scene from what appears to be a distant time later. So on to Hyperlight Drifter's presentation. Visually, for pixel art and the 18 and 16 bit design of the game, I really gotta say it's a gorgeous game to look at. Besides some of the breathtaking scenery, there's a lot of attention to detail in its lo-fi graphics. Exploration really gives a sense of wonder and piques curiosity of what's around the bend or down into one of the hidden chambers. If pixel art eye candy isn't your thing, then I could see fair gripes about it, but for those who dig it, this is a beautifully designed game. With the visuals, we'll have some incredible musical accompaniment with its soundtrack by Disasterpiece. I looked him up and was pleasantly surprised to find that he also did the soundtrack for the previous acclaimed indie game Fez, and the recent, and in my opinion, very enjoyable slow burn horror film It Follows. The music really hits the right cues when needed, and really helps to create this mystical immersive experience. It was soothing and mysterious while exploring, and intense and chaotic when situations got hot. Hyperlight Drifter's challenge I found to be particularly enjoyable. It's a tough game, don't get me wrong, and in many ways reminded me of the Dark Souls games, but it's forgiving. There were situations where I died over and over, yet I never got frustrated, but more determined each time to press on. Controls are tight, every skill and tool we have access to serves a purpose, and besides the necessity to master the dash maneuver, there's many ways to overcome whatever obstacles we face. I will say the shotgun is kinda ridiculously badass. When I originally saw the trailer for Hyperlight Drifter when it hit crowdfunding, I was beyond excited for it to be successful. Thanks to many people's similar sentiments, the funding was very successful. And that went into even more work on the game, and it really shows. The creator, Alex Preston, had a vision, and I'm sure glad he did. One interesting thing to note is he himself had his own affliction, as he's dealt with a serious heart defect most of his life. A lot of his struggles and emotions are apparent through the design of the game. And I think this being the case, really gives a unique feel to the game overall. Besides that, what a well made game. The passion shows through and through, and what this ended up being exceeded my expectations. I think for me it goes without saying, but I loved it. Hyperlight Drifter comes highly recommended for me, and what a great time to be able to experience such an incredible game. Thanks for checking out my review of Hyperlight Drifter. What were your thoughts on the game? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked what you've seen or heard, please give the video a like, a share, and subscribe to see future videos. I'm on Twitter and Facebook as well, and I post a lot of other great game-related content there, and of course links are in the description. Until next time on The Game Grinder.